Hello, and I'd like to welcome you to our uh, New Testament survey uh, here at uh, Faith Bible Institute, uh, presented by Faith Baptist Church. Uh, my name is Kim Fox, and I'm just very happy, excited that you were able to join us for this particular study. Uh, we are about to start a study on the book of Romans. Again, this is a survey, so just an overview uh, of each of these New Testament books. Uh, Romans will be doing in two parts, so today is just part one of the study on Romans. And so we always like to start with a word of prayer uh, as we <laughs> recognize uh, just how much we need the Lord to be able to get anything of value out of these studies. And especially um, when there's so much there, it's always hard to know which parts to uh, focus on and, and which parts may to gloss over. So uh, we really need the Lord's direction in all this that we can just retain what is important and needful for each of us out of this study. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you now for this opportunity to uh, study your word, to read your word, to consider its truths, its teachings, um, and to especially, Lord, to look at ourselves and evaluate ourselves in the light of uh, the perfect law of liberty. And so, God, may you speak to our hearts now, I pray. Help me uh, as I seek to present um, the the general and, and uh, important truths here in this book that is just so full of riches, Lord. And uh, so may you bless this time, I pray. Make it profitable in each of our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, Romans is the 45th book of the Bible, if I counted correctly. Uh, 45th book of the Bible, the first of Paul's writings, although not chronologically first, there was other books that wrote, Paul wrote before Romans. But as Schofield put it, uh, Romans is rightly placed first among the epistles because it is the most complete exposition in the New Testament of the central truths of Christianity. Okay, so you have Schofield's quotation there on the screen. Um, and also, there might be other reasons why it stands first in, among Paul's epistles, uh, notably because in this case of its destination, seeing as this letter was addressed to and sent to the imperial capital of Rome. So that may have given it a certain uh, level of importance compared to some of the other epistles. As far as the theme is concerned, pretty easy in this case to identify the theme. The epistle to the Romans is the gospel of the righteousness of God. And the central theme is justification by faith. Uh, that can be pretty easily uh, uh, discerned as we look at some of the key words that we find in this book. So the words uh, faith or believe, which both come from the same Greek word, one's the noun, the other's the, the uh, verb, but uh, used 55 times in this book. Uh, the word law, which is often in contrast with faith um, and with grace, um, is used 49 times. The words righteousness or justification, or justify, again, all those come from the same Greek root word, um, and then, depending on the context, translated differently, uh, but at any rate, uh, they're used 41 times, whereas in the entire New Testament, we only find these words about 100 times. So the lion's share of those particular words are found here in the Gospel of Romans. Uh, the word grace, 21 times, and the word gospel, 13 times. So again, the theme, justification by faith. The author uh, is indeed Paul. As he says in the very first verse of the epistle, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. And so Paul, also known as Saul of Tarsus, uh, was perhaps 50 years old uh, when he wrote this epistle. We don't know for sure. Um, but the authenticity of this book has never really been contested been contested. Um, there are several church fathers who confirm that Paul was the author. Clement of Rome, around 96 AD. Ignatius, about 115 AD. Polycarp in 116 AD. So these men were very early. Um, they, some of them knew some of the apostles, notably uh, the apostle John. Um, but uh, they all confirmed that these were the writings, or this was a, a writing of Paul. Um, and so since the very beginning, the church recognized this book's place in the canon of Scripture. Now, there are a few details that we know about Paul. Uh, first of all, he was a Jew and a Pharisee, uh, and he was also a Roman citizen by birth. 
Um, and as a Pharisee, he even trained, the Bible says, at the, f at the feet of Rabbi Gamaliel, a okay, well-known rabbi at that time. Uh, we know something of his physical appearance by his own writings and also by some other uh, writings that we have. But um, some of the things we know about Paul was that he was thin, uh, bowed legs, he was bald apparently, and suffered from some kind of an eye condition. Um, there's other verses in uh, Paul's writings that refer to some of that. We won't necessarily read them now. But in 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, for example, um, Paul, quoting some of his opponents, um, would say about him, about Paul, that his letters were heavy, were weighty, but his appearance was, um, and now I forget the word that they used, uh, was contemptible, I think is the right word. Uh, let me see again what the, how it was written. It says, 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, His letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Okay, there we go. <laughs> but um, so, not necessarily a very attractive individual. And in addition to that, we think there was some kind of an eye condition, uh, probably from traveling in the in desert areas and so forth. Um, so some kind of a weepy eye condition. But Paul says in Galatians, that at one point those Christians were ready to pull out their own eyes to give them to Paul if they could. Um, so indicating that he had some kind of a condition with those eyes. All that to say, he was not apparently a very attractive individual physically, but because he operated and preached uh, with the power of the Spirit of God, uh, his ministry was incredibly powerful, very effective. And then finally, we know that he accomplished several missionary journeys and all along those journeys suffered all kinds of persecution. And, uh, and then finally, he would be beheaded uh, in the city of Rome. As far as the date when this book was written, uh, apparently somewhere around 56, 57 AD, during Paul's third missionary journey. So we know that he wrote it before he went to Jerusalem for Pentecost. Um, we know that he was in the city of Corinth, or at least indications would show that he was in the city of Corinth when he wrote it because he did spend three months there before he headed to Jerusalem. And in addition to that, in Romans 16, verse 23, we read this. At the end of his letter, when he's giving greetings of different kind, he says, uh, Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Quartus, a brother. So he talks about Gaius his host, or Gaius, and uh, another man named Erastus. Well, uh, Gaius is also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1.14 as being a, um, as someone who lived in the city of Corinth. And Erastus is also mentioned um, in uh, other places as being in the city of Corinth. And Paul says here that he was the treasurer of the city. And so, by the, by the indication of these two individuals that he mentions and that are mentioned elsewhere in, in Scripture, we know those men lived in Corinth. And so since Paul is giving their greetings to the city of Rome, it seems he must have been in Corinth with them at that time. So some of the indications of where and when the, this letter was written. As far as the audience is concerned, um, again, very clear that it was addressed to the church of Rome in Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Paul begins his letter and makes a statement. He says, um, to, in verse 7, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's writing to the church of Rome, which was comprised of both Jews and Gentiles, mostly Gentiles, because in Romans 1.13, when he's talking about the church there, he says, Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. So by classing the Roman church as among the other Gentiles would indicate that there was a large number of Gentiles in the church there, which isn't surprising, right, being in the city of Rome. Um, in addition, he makes an interesting comment in chapter 3, verse 29, where, again, he's showing that uh, this church, that, that God was working in this church for both Jews and Gentiles. Chapter 329, he says, Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. So again, making the point that 
Um, ours is the God of both Jews and the Gentiles, as both were in the Church of Rome. Um, now, the Church of Rome was not founded by Paul. Numerous times he says in this letter that um, he had never been there. And um, uh, in chapter 1, verse 10, he says, Make your request if by some means, now at last, I might find a way in the will of God to come to you. Chapter 1, verse 15, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Um, and then he also makes some comments later on in chapter 15, where again, that he planned to go there, but he'd been hindered from going there up until now. So clearly, uh, Paul did not start the Church of Rome, um, but it was not founded by Peter either, even though uh, the Catholic Church, that would be their contention. Um, indeed, Luke, who traced the early Acts of the Apostles um, through the book of Acts, uh, was a very serious historian, and he certainly would have mentioned it if indeed Peter um, had been in Rome and was starting the church there. And there's no mention at all by uh, Luke. And in addition to that, in this book, Romans chapter 16, when Paul is going through a whole list of greetings that he's giving, he's greeting people at Rome, people that he knew who lived at Rome. Um, as he goes through this long list of names, Peter's nowhere to be found. Peter's never mentioned. And so that would be highly, highly uh, unthinkable that if Peter were truly at Rome at this time, that Paul would not have mentioned him in his greetings that he was sending. Um, now, it's true that the uh, historian Eusebius suggests that Peter started the church in Rome in 42 AD, but it is truly more likely with all the givens, all that we know about the um, uh, church history at this point, it is far more likely that it was founded by some of Paul's converts who were from other cities and then later moved to Rome. So, or maybe even Peter's converts on the day of Pentecost, that uh, we know that there were individuals from Rome who were visiting Jerusalem the day of Pentecost who got saved. They were among the 3,000. Um, and so they would have gone back to Rome and of course also would have begun to share their faith and would have um, had a church start at that point as well. So whether they're converts of Paul, uh, which is indicated by the fact that he knew so many people that lived there, Okay, he had some relatives who lived there, but he knew a lot of other individuals. So he, since he hadn't been there himself, he must have known those other individuals in other cities. And then those other people moved to him later on and became part of the church there. Now, the question is, what's the purpose of this letter? So according to Romans chapter 15 and verse 14, the church uh, appeared to be in very good health. And so we make this... Um, Let's read this text here, chapter 15, verse 14. Paul says, Now, I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So he, he, he gives the church, I mean, quite a compliment here, okay, referring to their maturity, uh, their knowledge of God's word, etc., um, and their ability to, to admonish or to counsel one another. So that being the case, if the church was in such good health, then what was his purpose for going there. Um, not only that, but in Romans chapter 1, Paul makes mention of the fact that the faith of these believers was, was known throughout the Roman Empire. Romans chapter 1, verse 8, he says, First, I thank my God, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So again, a really powerful statement here concerning the health, the testimony of the church of Rome. What then was the purpose of this letter? Well, first, uh, again, for a long time, Paul had the desire to visit Rome with the goal of encouraging and strengthening the church there. And so we, mentioned, we just read those verses in Romans chapter 1 a minute ago about how he had been hindered up to them, but he really desired to be with them in order to impart some spiritual gift and to encourage them in the faith. Um, and this desire of his had even received a direct confirmation from God shortly before Paul wrote this epistle. In Acts 23, verse 11, Paul, uh, God says this to Paul, uh, The following night the Lord stood by Paul and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Okay, so that's pretty clear. So God said, Paul, you're going to end up going to Rome, one way or the other. Even though you've been hindered many times, it's going to happen. So Paul knew that in his own heart. And so Paul was writing to inform the believers at Rome of his plans 
and to have them pray for the fulfillment of those plans. And so in Romans chapter 15, uh, Paul gives this uh, special prayer request, okay? And it's really quite, uh, um, quite compelling here. He says in Romans 15, verse 30, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So, I mean, he makes a really strong plea here uh, for them to pray that this plan that he has uh, would indeed not only take place, which he knew, I guess, because God told him he would, but that it would take place in the best conditions possible. Okay, having fulfilled his ministry elsewhere and being able to come to be refreshed with them together. And um, so that was one reason why he was writing, to inform the brethren at Rome of his plans to come and to visit and to minister among them. Um, he had a second purpose as well, undoubtedly, in that Paul had been battling against two significant errors in two different churches, um, and he certainly had to be concerned for the danger that those errors presented to the church in Rome. So first of all, um, perhaps about six years earlier, around 50 AD, the Judaizers, okay, the false teachers from Jerusalem, had come to Galatia from Jerusalem, okay, where Paul had ministered. And they were teaching that it was necessary to be circumcised and to adopt the Jewish religion in order to be saved. And that's what we call legalism. Um, so this doctrine requires men to trust in their own merits rather than to trust in those of the Savior. So obviously, such a heresy uh, could have destroyed the joy and the peace which comes from justification by faith alone and not by works, and it could have destroyed the work of God, in fact. And so Paul addresses this error in chapters 2 to 4 of the book of Romans, and also in chapter 8, where he explains that the life of the Spirit constitutes a stronger law than that of the, law, the Judaic law and the law of the flesh. So, that was one serious error that he needed to confront um, to prepare the Christians at Rome for this, this uh, her heresy that was circulating around in different cities. And then about two years earlier, around 55 AD, um, the church of Corinth began to mix carnal sins with the Christian life. Okay, So, perhaps they had not uh, fully understood the requirements of the grace of God for a pure life, but at any rate, they came up with the idea that practical life, practical Christian life is really not that important um, and that it can be lived however a person wants, uh, including even living immorally. Okay? And so um, this was yet another false teaching concerning the Christian life, which Paul addresses in Romans chapter 6, where he says that we are dead to sin. And then he also deals with it again in chapters 12 to 15, when he talks about different practical questions of the Christian life. So, um, again, knowing that those errors, those heresies were circulating uh, in, the, uh, uh, in various Roman cities at that time, Paul was kind of preempting uh, the infiltration of those heresies at Rome and was writing to the church to, again, give them sound doctrine to base their Christian faith and Christian life upon. All right, let's look at some key verses in this book. And uh, uh, again, not, un not exceptionally, there's so many verses, well-known verses that could be quoted. Um, but we're going to start with Romans 1, 16 and 17, because uh, that is, it really summarizes the theme of the book. Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So yeah, these two verses really do summarize uh, the theme of the whole book. And so looking especially at verse 17, where it makes that statement, the just shall live by faith. That's actually a quotation from uh, the Old Testament, from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And Paul quotes that same phrase other places in his writings, for example, in Galatians chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 10. 
Um, so again, it's a very significant phrase that is anticipating what he's going to develop throughout this whole book, the just shall live by faith. But there's also a question about um, another phrase in verse 17 where it says, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Kind of an enigmatic uh, statement there, from faith to faith. What is that referring to? Uh, I read somewhere, and I believe this is a good explanation of it, that the first part of that expression, from faith, is referring to the faith which saves us, so our justification. And the second part of that phrase, to faith, is referring to the faith, the principle of faith by which we're to live, okay, our sanctification. So from faith to faith is from saving faith, justification, to living faith, okay, the faith that we need to, uh, uh, that should strengthen us in our daily walk with the Lord, which is our sanctification, okay? So there's that very key, the, the keyest of verses, I guess we could call it, okay? Romans 1, 16, 17, but there are some other verses as well that stand out, and again, I'm sure you would have probably a lot of others that you'd want to recommend, but just some that I feel have um, certain significance to them. So chapter 2 and verse 4, we read this, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Um, so just a great reminder, okay, that God's goodness uh, indeed is meant to lead all of us to a place of repentance and faith in him. In chapter 5, verse 20, well, a very well-known expression, especially the second part of the verse, 520, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Okay, so that last phrase, especially very well-known, beautiful reminder um, of what God's grace is able to accomplish in our lives. Chapter 6, verse 14, we read this, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Okay, great reminder and encouragement to all of us believers. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Okay, so tremendous promise by God. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Still another, chapter 10, verse 17, where we read this important principle. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All right, so important reminder, people cannot have faith in Jesus Christ. They cannot be saved without hearing the word of God. Okay, so people need to hear the word of God specifically from us, okay, for them to be able to have faith in Christ. And so it's a reminder, again, that our lifestyle can never be enough to get anybody saved, all right? So they need to hear the Word of God, or they need to read it, all right? But they need to be exposed to the Word, and the idea in this passage especially is that it needs to be somebody who preaches it, and that is your responsibility and mine. Uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, okay, could not include these passages. Um, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body is a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So very familiar verses, but a powerful appeal by the Apostle Paul for all of us to fully give ourselves to God. Um, and he calls it, he says, that's just, that's an act of reasonable service. There's nothing more reasonable than to commit ourselves fully to God. I like this uh, phrase by um, a Frenchman by the name of Blaise Pascal. Uh, he wrote this, really, really well phrased. Two types of people who can be called reasonable, okay, based on this phrase in Romans 12, 1, which is your reasonable service. He says, two types of people who can be called reasonable, either those who serve God with all their heart because they know Him, or those who seek God with all their heart because they do not know Him. Wow, okay, that's, that's well said, all right? And how, how very absolutely true it is. Um, and then closing with chapter 15, of verse uh, 4, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, 
that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Yeah, so it's through reading the Scriptures that God produces hope within us. As we see what He accomplished in other people's lives, He says He wants to show us, even in the middle of trials, uh, in the middle of adversity, He wants to produce hope within us because we know we can, we can trust Him. Um, and He'll bring us through it. And then finally, chapter 15, verses 20 and 21. Now these are really from uh, the very personal to me, all right? And I'll explain why. Chapter 15, verses 20 and 21. Paul says, And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. So Paul makes a statement here that um, he had not yet gone to Rome, although he desired it very much, because he was driven by the knowledge of the fact that there were so many places around the empire uh, that had not yet heard the gospel. Now, why is that so personal to me? Uh, Well, in fact, it was while I was in seminary uh, preparing for ministry. Um, I didn't know what kind of ministry, but I just anticipated it would be somewhere here in America. I just, that was just seemed like the default setting. It seemed natural for me just to stay here in America to serve the Lord. And um, I was reading through the book of Romans, just, you know, for my own devotions. And I got to chapter 15 and I fell upon these verses. Now I'd already read chapter one where Paul had stated a couple times. We already saw those verses. He stated a couple times how he desired so strongly to go to Rome. Um, And it was for ministry purposes. And then chapter 15, he comes back to that Um, theme again. He says in verse 22, for this reason, I have been much hindered from coming to you. So even though he had a strong desire to go to visit Rome and to see these believers, to encourage them, he says in essence, he says, you know, I could not allow myself that that privilege or, or that blessing when I knew that there were so many places around the Roman Empire, so many cities where the gospel is not yet preached. He says there in Rome, there's a good church you know, I know many of you, Paul says, and I know that, that you guys have are sound in the faith and there's a good work going on there. So his point is, he says, like, so how could I allow myself to go to Rome when there are so many other places that have yet to hear the gospel? Well, as I read those verses, uh, God really spoke to my heart. I mean, it was, it was actually as if he sat next to me and just you know, said to me, Kim, what about you? You know, Paul was willing to forego his personal desires to go places where the gospel had not been preached. How about you, Ken? And, um, you know, my plan was to stay in America where there are just so many good churches and there's such a strong, you know, uh, Christian work here in America. And yet I was aware of, as I'm sure many of you are, there are so many places in the world where the gospel is not being preached. And it was right then and there, as God spoke to my heart, that I answered and said to him, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm willing to go. And, um, and so that was a starting point. Um, my wife was already very willing to go serve the Lord anywhere. But at that point, my wife and I uh, began to seek the Lord's face. And he led us then to missions for, for many years. But it was based on that particular verse. So just an example of how the word of God can just come alive. And I mean, just speak to your heart in a very personal way. Uh, that's certainly what the Lord did uh, in my life. Um, all right. So let's wrap up the study here today by looking at some special features of this book starting with uh, the literary style. Um, This epistle is definitely more of a didactic letter, that is a teaching letter, rather than apologetic or polemic. Apologetic being a defense of the faith or polemic being kind of confronting uh, errors or people or whatever. Um, This is more of a didactic letter, more teaching. And so it's interesting that Paul dictated his letters to a secretary, what we call an amanuensis, uh, he dictated his letters, and then somebody would write them out for him. And, uh, and then Paul would typically sign the letters in his own hand okay, to, to, to conclude the letter. And he makes reference to that in several different uh, uh, books of the Bible, uh, the end of 1 Corinthians, the end of Colossians, the end of 2 Thessalonians, are all examples where Paul then signs a letter in his own hand and sometimes makes the comment that he was writing in large letters. Again, it seemed to be a reference of his uh, failing eyesight or problem with his eyes. But um, what's interesting is we even know the secretary of this particular letter because in Romans 16, the secretary, the amanuensis of this letter, inserts his name. And so Romans 16, verse 22, he writes and says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. 
And so certainly he would have asked Paul permission and Paul would have said, absolutely, church, just put your name on there. But um, so we actually even know the person who was writing the letter for Paul as he dictated it. Um, but then also Paul desired, after he wrote these different letters and sent them to the churches, he desired for those letters to be read aloud in the church. And he makes reference of that in a couple of occasions. And so, for example, in uh, Colossians chapter 4, uh, at the end of the, the epistle to the Colossians, he says this, chapter 4, verse 16, Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. All right, so Paul was sending these letters out to different churches and said, you're to read them to the church in the presence of all the believers, and then you're to circulate those letters among the churches. And then again, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 27, he says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. Okay, so Paul was very clear how he wanted these letters to be shared with the churches and then circulated among the churches. All right, moving on, another important feature of this book um, is that Romans, as we said earlier about the theme, Romans presents the righteousness of God, or more specifically, a righteousness from God, which is revealed and is appropriated by faith, as we read in Romans 1.17. And I like the way that um, uh, Walvert and Zuck, in their commentary, um, summarize this idea. They said this, this righteousness from God is first the righteousness God himself possesses and manifests in all his actions. And second, it is the righteousness that God gives to human beings by grace through faith. This involves an imputed righteous standing before God, what we call justification, and an imparted righteous practice, the latter due to the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, which is what we call sanctification. All right, so I like the way that they phrase that, uh, again, kind of taking the theme of the book and showing how it's laid out throughout this book. Another notable feature, this epistle makes hardly any mention of eschatology. Okay, so in many of Paul's writings, in fact, in most books of the Bible, uh, have some reference to the end times, eschatology. But in this book, uh, Paul, except for a brief mention of Israel's salvation during the last days, uh, Paul really doesn't enter into much of a discussion of eschatology at all. Um, and then finally, to close, uh, these are some verses which maybe you're thinking I should have put under the key verses, but I didn't because I was going to present them here. The famous, the well-known Romans Road. Okay, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Perhaps some of you are not. This is a series of verses within the book of Romans that clearly presents the gospel. And so it's a pretty concise but clear way to share the gospel from one book of the Bible, the book of Romans. And uh, what I encourage you to do is these four main verses, I would encourage you to underline those verses. So it makes it easier to find them, okay? And, um, and easier when somebody's going to read them. If you, pointed, you, know, if, you, if you show them your Bible and ask them to read, they can find the verse easier when it's underlined. But at any rate, uh, to underline these main verses, and as you go through it, it doesn't take... There doesn't need to be much of an explanation at all, okay? Um, the verses are quite clear. Now, I do add some other verses sometimes to maybe add a little bit more explanation. You can add other verses as you desire, but really these verses are almost sufficient all to themselves. So, for example, Romans 3.23, um, uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, so the important principle to, dis to establish right at the start that all have sinned. And uh, in, in case there's any question in the person's mind, that's where I quote sometimes these other verses, verse 10, which says that there is none righteous, no, not one. And verse 19, which really seals the deal, uh, it says, verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, the law of God, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So this first verse, again, at verse 23, is not clear enough? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 19 nails it uh, by saying that, in fact, we stand before God. Okay, We're not going to be there um, justifying ourselves, explaining ourselves, uh, convincing God of the good things we've done. He says our mouths are going to be stopped. Okay, um, And as we stand before a holy God and the holy angels, etc., in heaven, um, in a sinless place called heaven, the Bible says the only word that will possibly come out of our mouth is the word guilty. Okay. I am guilty. I am a guilty sinner. 
From there, we go to Romans 6, 23. Okay? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that first phrase, the wages of sin is death. Okay, follow up to Romans 3.23, all have sinned, and now it says the wages of sin is death. And again, to explain what death is referring to here, I often quote some other verses that also talk about death in that it's not only physical death, it's also spiritual death. And so not only do our bodies die because of sin that's entered into the world, but we are also going to ex uh, experience spiritual death. And so, for example, in Ezekiel 18.20, it says the soul that sins will die, all right? So not just the body is going to die, but the soul that sins will die. And that is spiritual death. It's being separated from God uh, for eternity in a place of to torment that we call hell. And so uh, that's the, the sad reality, okay? We've all sinned, and therefore we deserve death, both physical and spiritual. But the wonderful thing about that verse, I'd love to always emphasize this. In the middle of the verse, it says, the wages of sin is death, but... Okay, that is a fantastic and fantastically important word, but, okay? Because if we stopped at the first phrase, all of sin and the wages of sin is death, period, there wouldn't be much good news in that, would there? Okay, no hope in that. But thankfully, the verse continues, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what we cannot deserve are on our own because we are sinful, we are guilty, God is now offering to us as a gift, as a free gift. And that is eternal life with him through Jesus Christ. Now, why does eternal life come through Jesus Christ? Romans 5, 8, which says that God commends his love toward us. He demonstrates, he proves his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so the Bible says that Jesus took our sins upon himself and he died in our place. Okay, the wages of sin is death. Jesus was without sin. He didn't have to die. But when he took our sin upon himself, the death that we deserve, both physical and spiritual, Jesus experienced in our place. And so he took our punishment, he took our death so that we could receive life through him. And only through him because he's the only one who paid that price, who laid down his life, his perfect sinless life for us. And so some of the other verses that go along with that, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 that says that he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, there it is, okay? He became sin for us. He, he uh, suffered the penalty for that sin in our place. And now we can receive the righteousness of God through Jesus, all right, because of his sacrifice for us. And then 1 Peter 3.18, it says that Jesus suffered once for sins. He died the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. And so, again, you can feel free to add other verses or not, or just stick with these key verses here, and again, with very little explanation, point out how these verses are connected. And so now knowing that Christ gave up his life for us, that he died for us, how can we benefit from that? How can we be saved? Romans 10, verses 9, 10, and 13 um, bring this to a conclusion. Verse 9, that says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God rose, raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so the Bible says that what God wants from us now is he wants for us to Call out to him. That's what verse 13 says. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So God wants us to call out to him, believing in our hearts that God, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that he rose from the dead on the third day. He says we need to believe that in our hearts and then we need to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, okay, that he is Lord. Okay, he did give up his perfect life for us. He did die in our place. He did rise again from the dead. And he alone can save us. Okay, we need to believe that. And then we need to ask him to save us. And he says, whoever does that, whoever calls upon me, he says, at that very moment, that person will be saved. God will save you. And so, again, some other verses I quote sometimes to kind of uh, uh, add a little bit to that. John 1, 12, it says, as many as received him, Jesus Christ, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Or again in Revelations 3.20, where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. Okay, so this idea, just a beautiful illustration, I think, this idea of salvation, but the idea that we need to receive Christ, okay, personally. It's a personal decision. 
where we recognize that we are lost in our sin, we are guilty, we are hell-bound. We recognize that Jesus, we believe that Jesus died on the cross for us. He paid for our sins on the cross. He rose again and that he alone can give us forgiveness of sin and eternal life with him in heaven. And the Bible says as a person believes that and calls on the name of the Lord and receives Jesus Christ by faith into their lives, trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone, again, God's promise is at that moment, dear friend, you will be saved. So, great way to kind of finish the study, part one of the study, okay? And uh, like I said, if you haven't already done so, I encourage you to underline those verses in your Bible. But I also would like to encourage you to do one more thing. I'd like to encourage you to pray and to ask God to lay in your heart some person, or I should say some persons, uh, that you know that are not saved, that aren't Christians, and that you could share the Romans road with. Now, maybe you have another way of sharing the gospel, and that's fine too if you have other verses that you prefer. But again, this is a very effective way, a very simple, clear, uh, straightforward way of sharing the gospel. But I would really encourage you to really make it a matter of prayer and ask the Lord to put in your heart some people that you know, co-workers, neighbors, family members who aren't saved. And like the Bible says, the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. They need to hear the Word of God. And you are certainly God's chosen instrument to share the gospel with them. So would you pray about that? And ask the Lord to direct you to be able to share His Word, to share this wonderful news of salvation with those precious souls around you. All right, well, again, I want to thank you for joining us. I remind you that next week, uh, Lord willing, we'll be doing part two. I hope you can join us for that. But let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be able to study your word. Thank you for the freedoms that we have to do that. Thank you, Lord, for how you do speak to our hearts from your word, Lord God. And I pray that every time we open your word, we would desire for you to speak to us. We would want to grow, not just in knowledge, but in our walk with you, Lord, in our commitment to you, like Romans 12, 1 says, um, to, to yield our bodies as a living sacrifice to you, Father. And so I pray that each person that has listened to this study today would be encouraged in their faith, uh, encouraged in their walk with you, and they would be more determined, Lord, to live for you. And even as we said here at the end, to pray, that they would pray and want to be used by you to be a witness to other people, Lord. So thank you for visiting with us today. Uh, thank you for speaking to our hearts. Give each of us now, Lord, a good day, a good week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks again for joining us. God bless you.